Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multimillionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by world-renowned direct response copywriter, marketing strategist, author, and copywriting coach, David L. Deutsch. David wrote promotions profitably mailed to millions. In addition to creating winning promotions from scratch, he often works with clients and writers behind the scenes to turn underperforming promotions into winners. David started at Ogilvy & Mather on Madison Avenue, working with clients such as Merrill Lynch, General Foods, and American Express. He then switched to to direct response, where he has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in sales for leading direct response marketers, entrepreneurs, and publishers, including Agora and Boardroom Inc., which is now Bottom Line Publications. For these, he's he's had as many as six winning controls at once. David supervises, coaches, and trains writers and copy teams both in the U.S. and around the world, including Germany, China, Singapore, England, Colombia, and Romania. He is the author of Million Dollar Marketing Secrets, as well as Think Inside the Box, an acclaimed book on generating ideas. He's also written a memory course and co-authored a guidebook to Bermuda. And I've asked David to join us here today to help us understand how we can apply world-class copywriting to our businesses better. So, David, thank you so much for joining us, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's great to be here, (laughs) Doug. And it's an honor and a pleasure to have you. I've actually tried to get this interview with you a couple of times, but I mean, you've got such a busy schedule and you're in such high demand. Now, something that always fascinates me is because you've spanned, you've been doing this for years, like tens and tens of years, and you've seen so many different trends and phases come and go. But I'm curious about what was it like when you first got started? Like, do you come from an entrepreneurial family? How did you even get going into marketing and sales and direct response? What was your first introduction? Yeah, I no, I don't. I mean, my father was a psychotherapist, so I guess he was kind of an entrepreneur in that sense. Um, but I, I really just kind of fell into it. You know, I um, I was working um, in the, uh, you know, I was working in like uh, kind of like word processing at Ogilvy and Mather in New York City. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just trying kind of between teaching jobs and trying to earn money. And I, I didn't really care. Oh, it's an ad agency. That's interesting. And then the more I was there, the more I was like, oh, this is kind of really interesting. You know, maybe I could try my hand at writing this stuff. So I tried my hand at writing it and was good at it and became a copywriter at Ogilvy and Mather and uh, then went on to other jobs at other ad agencies. That's awesome. So now what were some of your greatest challenges in learning how to write copy and learning how to make it work for the different clients that you had? It. You know, it's interesting. My challenge in a way was that I'm very good at writing. I'm very good at putting words together. I'm very good at making things sound like they're supposed to sound like. Mm-hmm. And um, as a consequence, I had to very intentionally learn how to really sell through writing more mm. and learn how to kind of speak from the, you know, from the heart more with, you know, genuine enthusiasm and passion. So that's a really interesting thing you said. So you had to learn to sell with words more and speak from the heart. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, how does that apply speaking from the heart? And these are two different questions, so forgive me, but how does that apply? And then what's what's different about selling with words? Well, I think, you know, sometimes when you read something, you can kind of tell that the words are there, but the feeling isn't there. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds like this sort of thing is supposed to sound like. And it doesn't have the same impression on you that it does when someone is speaking more from the heart when the words are new and fresh and um, and speak to you directly in a different way, like someone's really talking to you. Mm, mm, mm. Does that, that, that make sense? 
It does because what you're talking about is like a feeling. It's not just the words, but it's the it's the I don't know if enthusiasm is the right word, but I yeah I definitely get what you mean. I mean, there's like you know uh, we've all been in school where we've had to read a textbook, right? And the words are there, mm-hmm. but then there's like a letter from your friend explaining this amazing thing or something that they're just really excited to share with you. Um, yeah, and it doesn't matter if he's not you know using words brilliantly and being witty and putting words together in a clever way. You know, it mm-hmm. just matters that he's got this tremendous enthusiasm and he's sharing it with you. Mm-hmm. 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 So now how do we approach selling through print? This is a, again, a big wide topic, but for we have a wide range of people in our audience. Some people that do understand the importance of copy in their business. Some people that don't mm-hmm. understand the importance of copy in their business. But how does that, because a lot of people, I see this like in catalogs sometimes, not well done ones, but catalogs where they just, it's very factual, like, this is the product, da, 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 right? Like how, how does offline face-to-face selling translate into an online version? Because I think people can grasp face-to-face better. Well, you know, it, it's very much an analogy. You know, it's very much a good sales letter is really just a good sales argument or even good catalog copy is just good selling good one-on-one selling translated into um into print or online you you could basically almost transcribe a good sales pitch mm. and in a way copy should be a good sales pitch should at least be based on you know a good sales pitch right so now do you believe in copywriting formulas and processes and flows or how do you, how, what would you recommend to someone who's starting out or maybe just struggling and they're listening to this and they, they've heard that they have to, cause I remember I heard that before. I used to hear that all the time, like copy, like copy, you got to master how to write copy. You got to write, to, you know, it's all about copywriting ads and copywriting conversion. Um, you know, but it didn't really like, I didn't understand how to use copy or, or even how to approach it. Now, would you, what would you recommend to anyone that's starting out or struggling? You know, I think before you could sell anything in in terms of writing copy, you've got to be able to sell it one on one. So the first thing is really to to hone your sales argument, you know, to another person, be that mm-hmm. an imaginary person that you're kind of envisioning and you're talking to them or be that to your spouse or partner or friend, um, co-worker. Whoever it is, like be able to get them excited about whatever it is that you're writing this copy about. And because you'll say certain things to them, you know, you'll say, oh, it does this. And they'll just give you a blank look or they'll be bored. They'll start taking their phone and you'll say, but wait, it does this. And then their eyes will light up. So, you know, oh, that's something I need to talk more about. At a certain point, they'll they'll be bored or confused. Mm-hmm. by what you're saying. They'll say, I don't understand why that makes it so great. And you'll say, well, because blah, blah, blah. And they'll say, I still don't understand. And you'll say, well, because of blah, blah, blah. And, oh, I still don't understand. Well, it's also got blah, blah, blah. Say, oh, now I understand. Right. And so then- now you've really learned, you know, what to, to put in your copy. So that's that's the basis, you know, is to be able to have that, whether you want to call it a pitch or an elevator speech, um, uh, a letter that you write, you know, a letter that you write to someone you care about, mm-hmm. you know, dear mom, here's why, here's why I think you should buy this product, <laughs> subscribe to this newsletter, you know, take this course. Now, how does that apply when you have these sales letters with a, a headline and a lead in that seems unrelated to the product? Well, I think in the same way that you don't always want to talk to someone about something directly that they may have a certain, let's say, resistance to, because, you know, they've heard it all before. Like if you know your mother doesn't, um, you know, want to read a book on, you know, how to be healthier, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you might not say, hey, mom, I got a book for you on how to be healthier. It's a great book. It'll do this. It'll do that. You might say, mom, you want to live to a ripe old age and see your grandchildren, don't you? You know, you don't want to be suffering with the, you know, the arthritis that you've got and, 
you know, you don't want to, you know, you, you want to be able to, to knit and dance and play tennis and, and do those things you love. You know, that, that's why it's, it's so important to know what's going on in the health world today, because you can't depend on doctors anymore. They're too busy to, to look after your health. All they can do is really kind of fix up if something, if it goes really wrong, give you some drugs for it, you know, cut it out, you know, do some surgery, you know, give you pills. And so that's why knowing what to do is so important, you know, taking charge of your own health. And I, if I could, if I told you about a way to do that, mom, would you be interested? You know, so now you've kind of, you know, it's, it, that's much more of an indirect approach, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that was a fantastic example. Uh, and especially one that I think a lot of people can, can relate to, because I think that's a huge, obviously I know you wrote, you wrote health copy as well, but, but a lot of people can relate to that because there's a lot of people that go to the doctor and plug their umbilical cord into them and expect them to be their savior and just doctors are just too busy it's just not the case right your client one of 20 coming through the door and you know they're taking snapshot looks at you and making yeah. gross assumptions about things so i think it's a fantastic fantastic way to relate it so it's really it's about getting down kind of a a, a repeatable kind of concept i mean it's really about getting down a repeatable conversation that you can have to lead someone from a mild interest to understanding the value, importance, and urgency of it, and then making sort of like a, a great offer to them. Yeah, I sometimes it's about that. Sometimes they already start with a lot of interest, you know? Right. right, right. That's the thing about copywriting is it's so um each situation is is kaleidoscopically unique. Right. It's a different market, it's a different product to that market. The times are different. Mm -hmm. True. The sophistication of the market is different. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Now, how do offers come into play? How important is the offer in what you're writing? And, and what do you do if you have a client that has what you feel is a weak offer? How do you determine the strength of an offer? Well, I think you always want to have the offer be as powerful as possible, um, because that's ultimately what people are you know, responding to or buying. Um, and of course, one way to do that is, is just how you describe it right? How you paint it, how you phrase it, how you frame it, all the things you can do through copy to make something seem in as good a light as possible. But the other thing you can do is just to improve the offer, you know, add bonuses to it, add free stuff to it. You also get this. If it's a product, you get a certain degree of service with it. Maybe there's an in, maybe there's an information product that comes with it. We'll also send you this book. Um, you know, there's always there's always things you can do to an offer. You can cut the price on it. You could make them the price be an installment plan. Oh, you don't have to pay a thousand dollars all at once. You could pay, you know, three hundred dollars four times over the course mm -hmm. of a couple of months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now when you first started out in copywriting, what was your exposure? Were you just thrown in with the wolves type thing? Did they have you doing parts of the promotion and gradually increase you, like gradually introduce you to more and more to where you kind of became your own copy chief? Or like, how what was that progression like in your career? Well, certainly at Ogilvy, you know, you were always working under people, you know, being instructed and mentored by people. You always had David Ogilvy's example kind of shining down on you, um, very much part of the culture. It was kind of like a teaching hospital in a way, mm. you know, so that, you know, that was tremendously helpful, um, you know, and yeah, you, you would do parts of things, you would revise things, you would, you know, do a small ad, you know, in advertising, they had what's called trade advertising, right? So instead of doing a, um, a, a television ad for Maxwell House Coffee, I might do a trade ad to get grocers to stock more Maxwell House Coffee on their shelves. Right. So it wasn't always so, it wasn't always the end consumer. Sometimes you're influencing the provider. You're getting right. right. Got it. Right. That's yeah. I remember reading that in uh, Scientific Advertising, great book. But that that sometimes it's not about mm -hmm. selling more your product. It's to the end user. It's 
selling it to the people who will put your product in front of more users. Right, right. Mm. And of course, that, you know, continued. I, you know, as I went into direct response, I, I worked under some, you know, under some great people like Jim Rutz. And, um, you know, I've worked with, you know, people like John Carlton and Jim Punkery and, you know, Dan Rosenthal um, and, you know, learn something from each of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, so how did it, so you even said like you started writing at Ogilvy Mather, Mather, but then you transferred over into direct response. So what were you doing before and what did they have you doing when you first started? What was I doing before you mean at the ad agencies? Right. Well, because you said you were writing, but then you transferred into direct response. So I'm wondering oh, what oh, the difference oh, oh. was. Oh, I more than transferred, I guess I got out of advertising. Like I left the ad agency world. Um, I got inspired from some Jay Abraham material that I read. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to be like Jay Abraham. So I I just kind of quit and I <laughs> set up shop. <laughs> um, and it's funny, you know, I I did copy more than I did Jay Abraham type stuff, which is kind of more like, you know, if I make you a dollar, will you give me a quarter? And, you know, optimizing people's resources and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just found it was much easier to make money. You know, people wanted to write me checks to to write copy. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of got into doing that. And but today I'm doing more of the other thing. It's more working in a more, you know, Jay Abraham way with companies mm -hmm. to help them grow their business. And of course, copywriting being one, the, the main way of doing that. But it's working with them in more of a partnership. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, that makes perfect sense. Because there's a ton of businesses out there, even, and it's almost like the bigger the business, the greater the opportunity there is. I mean, if you have someone that's doing a million dollars a month, you, you can make some massive improvements for them with some minor tweaks. But if you have someone that's only doing a hundred thousand a year, it, you could, those same tweaks you would make may not produce equally substantial results. Um, right. right, right. No, so I totally, totally understand that. So now, what are you, some of the biggest mistakes that you see clients and other entrepreneurs making with their copy? Again, this is really vague, but just in your experience with working with a lot of people that are trying to write copy and, and when you see a lot of people whose, whose campaigns are underperforming, are there kind of like a handful of reasons why? Like, do you have a checklist that you kind of go through at this point? You've been doing this so long that it's, it's probably one of these 12 things that's causing them to trip up over, their, over themselves? Oh, gosh, you know, there's so many things. Um, sometimes the copy is just bad. I mean, they're, the client is obviously either doesn't know what good copy is or is kind of unwilling to invest in good copy. Um, you know, and it's a little self-serving, I guess, since I'm kind of a high-priced copywriter. But, you know, a lot of the most successful people I see out there are people that are just willing to pay for the best copy. You know, I realize that's kind of easy for me to say because it's not I'm not, you know, paying tens of thousands of dollars for copy out of my own pocket. Um, and they are. But, you know, I mean, you know, boardroom was built like that. They were just willing to pay for the best copywriters. Mm -hmm. And hence they, you know, grew to a hundred million dollar company right. you know, very rapidly. Same thing with Agora um, today. You know, that's that's where a lot of the best copywriters are. Um, Agora is more, um, invests more in training internally, you know, but they, but they do both. Right. You know, invest in outside copywriting as well as, you know, inside. So let's, so let's talk about that. Like when a company floats on a sea of copy, because there's different types of companies, like car companies, they use copy in their company for sure, but they, you know, for them, I believe, and Correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. The primary movers are the sales reps meeting the people, going for test drives, really kind of getting the, the pen to paper, sign the contract. But for a company that's floating on copy, how does it like, what does that look like for a company to float on copy? Because again, trying to come back to, like you say, they, they hire the best copywriters. What are they hiring these best copywriters for? Are these best copywriters also helping uh, edit? customer service responses to typical frequently asked questions 
like if you're going to hire a high price copywriter, what is it that what's the highest leverage activities that you need them to be invested in? Well, certainly customer acquisition and maximizing customer value is, you know, is huge. But you bring up a good point too. It's, you know, it's a good idea to use copywriters at a lot of different, you know, points of leverage along the way. And the, as you said, the, the telemarketing sales script could be one of them. You know, the email, you know, series that you send out could be another one. You know, more and more today, copy isn't just, you know, kind of one sales letter, you know, one and done. It's, um, it's optimizing a lot of points along the, the funnel of acquiring and, and maximizing customers. Mm. Yeah, let's talk about that now, because you said something interesting. It's not just one and done. Is that how it used to be? Would a company be able to grow and build and become a fairly substantial size organization off of a single letter? Because is that, is that how it used to operate? I'm, I'm, I kind of feel like I already know the answer, but I, I want to, I'm curious to know, like, because now there's a big contrast. A lot of people listening to this won't be able to understand the world pre-internet because they've either always grown up with it or it's just right. been around them so long they can't really remember what it was like before. And so what was it like then? Like you would, yeah, like a, a, you'd hire a high price copywriter, say, hey, I need some more customers. They would interview you, ask questions of you, and then they would disappear for a few weeks or a month or two and then come back and give you something that you send out to people. <clears throat> and that... Yeah, I you know, I would say it was, it's still like that, you know, in some circumstances, sure. you know, but I think it was more like that then. Right. Um, and, you know, but now there's kind of other ways of doing that. You know, there's, there's the whole funnel thing and the whole idea of maximizing response along every point of the funnel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because after all, if you're, if your order form, you know, if if twice as many people who get to your order form buy, right? Mm -hmm. If you can increase that by making it clearer, more powerful, maybe putting a sales message on it, you know, whatever you need to do, you know, that that's as good as twice as many people responding to your, you know, your yep. sales letter. Yep. Yep. It still doubles your customers. Yep. Yeah, I've I've actually helped do that thanks to the power of like doing online testing. We've doubled mm -hmm. sales for a company with no change, same amount of traffic, same advertising budget, same product they're selling, just changing the page that people purchase on, just improving the order form. Which is fantastic. Yeah. And, and I think you know, oh, there's five other points right. along you know, along the way. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, we were talking about this kind of before, like now content plays a big part of this where, you know, in the online world, people, you, there's so many, there's, it's such a, an information economy now with the abundance avail and available of available information on the internet. I mean, you just go to Google. What people don't get is it's changed in a lot of ways how copywriting works because now I can go to Google, I can ask it any question, I can get literally millions of results sent back to me, right? That Google or mm -hmm. Bing or whoever will organize into, you know, di into what they feel is most relevant. But the other part that people don't understand is, is that we as advertisers, we can go and we can look up these keywords people look of search. And often people, they, they gloss over how powerful keyword research can be because the keyword represents a thought that someone has. And other people, other guests we've had, like Glenn Livingston on the show, he's been able to prove that just by guinea pig versus guinea pigs, shows a different, like different intent, different state of awareness, different state of sophisticated, different people looking for different things, whether it's the mm -hmm. guinea pig or guinea pigs. And uh, one wants to buy information about pets for their kids and replace the one that just died and, you know, without their child knowing. And the other one is just doing research for a school project, right? And they mm -hmm. just want to know like where they're from and how long they live and blah, 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 and just kind of the more static stuff. So. Oh, I thought you were going to say, and the other wants to be in medical experiments. <laughs> well, that's kind of it. It's very like it's very like research project. Maybe they are going to dissect some, but it's not it's not the one that you want to sell your pet supplies to or your your ebook on right. how to how to make your guinea pig live and last longer. So, 
So it really has changed the face of the, the world today. And, and a lot of people, like when you talk about a funnel, a lot of that is having taken your traditional sales letter and putting it sideways. So instead mm -hmm. of having the one event top to bottom, uh, putting it sideways. Now, do you still feel that there's a place for direct mail? How, how do you see people using direct? If yes, how do you see people using direct mail this day versus before? Well, I think in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, direct mail is much more strategic now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, there's a big opportunity because since a lot of people aren't doing direct mail mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons, um, it's a huge opportunity if you are willing to make the investment and are willing to, um, you know, take the time to make it work. Mm -hmm. because direct mail is so scalable, as Brian Kurtz likes to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the internet, it's hard to scale. It's hard to, you know, all of a sudden you're spending huge amounts to try to, you know, buy traffic um, past a certain point. But on direct mail, once you find something that works to this zip code, this type of person, there's millions and millions and millions of, you know, of people that, you know, resemble that zip code, that type of person that you can then mail to. Mm -hmm. Which I think that is a big frustration because there's people that like even Facebook advertising is really hot this day and age. And Facebook's having a huge ad inventory issue uh, where they just don't have the inventory to meet the supply and it's boosting up the prices, which just has people wanting to leave. And it's, you know, they're trying to find that balance. And this is something that Google AdWords went through years ago before. Mm -hmm. But with direct mail, it's so well established, like you said. And I guess one of the things that keeps people from it is the, the cost of playing, right? The cost of right. putting you right. right. So how do you step into that? Well, I think you're right that, you know, because the internet is so, in a way, inexpensive to use in a certain sense, that it makes people kind of lazy. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, direct mail. Oh, I got to buy lists. I got to um, I got to get stuff printed, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, it becomes kind of a barrier to entry now mm -hmm. becomes a huge competitive advantage. Mm. Right. Because if you are willing to spend a little bit of money and treat it like a sales rep and invest in helping it. Helping it like like a sales rep, you wouldn't expect them to sell the first day at the job, the first week, maybe even the first month. They right. still get understand they're just trying to figure it out. But a lot of people when they spend money on marketing, they want to see an ROI right away, right? And that yeah. kind of defeats one of the tenets of direct response marketing, where you have to be able to know your lifetime customer value. That way, maybe you don't make a profit on the first introduction, but you can you can get you have a a, a methodical, systematic way of turning an an, an inquiry into a multi-buyer and you know that you know maybe you break even on the first purchase we have three more offers that you're going to send them and by the end of it you'll make a hundred dollars per name mm -hmm. you know you mentioned earlier the whole the what are the mistakes people make mm -hmm. and one of the mistakes that people make and you just said it in relation to direct mail but it's true in other things as well online as well is they don't test enough mm. And there's a huge advantage in being able to test, you know, split test things in being able to, to keep in a sort of Darwinian way. Does this work better than this? Does this work better than this? Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. test this against this. Mm -hmm. And then you wind up with this, you know, super control that you'd uh, never have come to just on the first shot. Right. Right, because right, you, right. You've let the market tell you yep. what they respond to and what they want. And so, in your experience, what were the top, like, was there a hierarchy of tests to do? Are there tests that people shouldn't do? Do you have any guidelines to help people with in regards to testing? Yeah, I think the biggest thing to test is price. Really? Well, because price not only impacts whether people are going to respond, right? Yep. Um, it also in it also impacts how much money you're going to make directly. Right. In other words, it's one thing if you know, oh, you get a you get a ten percent better response if people you know if, at this price than this price. They like this number better. Mm 
Right. But if you could charge twice as much for your your product and you're charging, you know, right half as much as you should be, I've actually, that's a lot of money you're leaving on the table. I know. I've actually seen that. I've seen people try like a one pay versus a three pay um, and they have a minimal change in conversion when they had a three pay versus a one pay. And I mean, that's three times the profit per sale. Mm hmm. So. That's a, that's fascinating. Okay, what else did you test? Because I was actually expecting you to say headline, because that's what everybody says. Oh, you got to test your headline, because if you double the number of people who read it, then you'll double the number of people that come out the bottom end. But um, yeah, that's fascinating. Like I also heard, like when you start your promotion, you should actually make the price as low as possible, so you can try to optimize everything else first, right? Figure out which headlines working, which body copy. You know, make the make it as much as low as you can, just so you're because you need conversions in order to know what's working and not working, and the price can be yeah. a barrier. So lower the price as much as you can, but then once you feel that you've done a good job working your way down, do the price. And I I think that you're right. I think the price is probably one of the most powerful things to test if you can, because you, like we just established, you can make three times the money and, and hardly you know lose any any sales. Um, you could be that grossly overcharging or undercharging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know about the price at as low as you can thing. I mean, that, that's kind of an interesting idea, and it's probably true in some cases, but it may also be kind of dangerous because, you know, you never – you're always working your way up in price in that case. Right. And if you write the copy based on $29, it's it's different copy than if you write the copy based on, you know, $199. Right. Right. Yeah, very true. It'll 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 have a a whole psychological influence on on like every word you write, the way you say things, the way you justify things the the value that it feels like you like how much you have to justify the value of it mm, right you can't just yeah dan rosenthal taught me this a long time ago you can't just you can't just change the price like if you're going to change the price you should go through the whole letter and change a lot of other things as well mm, right because people if ten dollars is a big difference than a hundred dollars and people and like you said, you'll have to really back that up. And what might be very compelling at ten dollars might not be compelling at all for a hundred dollars. Right. And the justification that I have to give you to spend ten dollars to hundred dollars is very different than the justification I have to give you to spend ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Like ten dollars, it's almost like an, an an impulse sale. Like, mm -hmm. hey, just send for it. You know, it could change your life. Yep. For goodness sakes, how could you? Why are you even hesitating? Yeah. Whereas I can't do that. That copy won't work for a hundred dollars. Right. For a hundred dollars, I got to make it very clear that you know, it's a, and I got to guarantee, you know, and you're going to get your money back too. You don't have to worry. Right. Whereas ten dollars, it's almost not worth it to even ask for your money back. So, right. You know, it's a whole different thing. So, what habits do you feel have really helped you on your path to success as a copywriter? Dealing with clients, is there like routine things that you go through with every client, or even yourself as you get into a promotion? What do you feel are the habits that you see over and over and over again, or even, yeah, that you saw or witnessed in some of these greats that you master, you studied under and the things that have helped you become a master yourself? I think the habit of market focus, it shocked me one time when I was talking to um, one of the people that I've worked with is Jim Punkery. And I remember the first time I went to meet with him, I was like so excited. Oh, I'm going to learn all about his you know, techniques. I'm going to, he's going to tell me all his secrets for how he, you know, does things, his formulas, his, his little tips and tricks, you know, that we, that we always want to learn. And I went and talked with him and he didn't want to talk about any of that stuff. He wanted to talk about the market. What is the market interested in? Where do you think the market is going? You think they're tired of hearing about this? Do you think that they've, um, do you think that they've, uh, started hearing about this yet? Is this old news to them? Um, you know, what's keeping them up at night? These these kinds of questions were mm. what what fascinated him. And, um, you know, the same thing with with other writers, too. They don't there's not a lot of interest in technique, per se. You know, they know the techniques, they know the formulas, they know, you know, certain 
certain things that they do, but but really what interests them is in getting under people's skin and communicating with them in a very deep, a deep level, you know, to really address what keeps them up at night and what their secret desires are. Mm. And how would you establish that pre-internet? Like I can give you 101 ways to get, do some of that research now with internet tools, but how would you do that in an offline world? Talking to people, mm. talking to people that are familiar with those people. You know, that's a, a big, a big secret is for every group of people out there, right? If you want to know what makes chiropractors tick, because after chiropractors are very different than doctors and doctors and chiropractors are very different than dentists, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to know those unique things that make chiropractors tick, you know, what they're pissed off about, what, what keeps them up at night, what they really want, um, then there are people who deal with chiropractors on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who sell stuff to them. There's a chiropractors association. There's people who have been writing copy for chiropractors for years. Talk to them. And of course, talk to chiropractors. Mm -hmm. They'll, you know, they'll give you an earful. Right, right, right. Go, go, go get an adjustment and talk to the chiropractor right. while you're getting treated, you know? Now, are there general questions you want to know? About, I mean, obviously, it's probably product and service specific, but are there generalities that you want to know as well? Like things, like you talked about what keeps them up at night and what they really want. Does that, are those questions that you kind of still generally ask, even if you're selling travel packages versus you're selling them real estate versus if you're selling them a new car versus you're selling them some new electronic gizmo, do those things still matter? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and you're right. There, there are questions that, that go across all, you know, all segments, all markets, right? You know, you want to know, you want to know what they really want, right? What's their ultimate objective? Mm. Um, you know, do they want security for their, you know, in, in relation to this particular product, right? Right. Um, you know, if it's a product that's going to help a chiropractor manage his business, right? Well, what does he ultimately want, right? Right. Does he want more money? Does he want respect? Does he want security? Does he want more patience? Does he want to beat out the chiropractor down the block? Does he want the recognition that chiropractors kind of don't get because they're not really doctors and they're not really, you know what I mean? They don't I, have that medical degree. So there's a kind of a. I do. You know, I know. I had a friend. He had an online, like, he had an online martial arts membership site that he was mm -hmm. member they was scaling and i was i watched him go from zero to like seventy five thousand a month so i think his max was about one hundred and eighty thousand a month his membership site that he had and i remember the conversations that we would have because we always talked and kept in touch were different and he was studying uh when a john john carlton apparently wrote a lot of letters for that niche and he was mm -hmm. talking about how he was analyzing the letters and then his conversations changed from uh selling what the product was to selling like masculinity and like this, almost like this persona, like the letters, he was like, he's not selling, he's not selling the martial arts training. He's selling like being the badass that can get the girl, you know, and like that kind of that, that, that's that. Um, right. Right. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm, I'm fumbling over my words, but yeah, he's yeah. trying to sell that. Can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Like how does, how do we do that with your copy? Why? Like we haven't, I don't know if we talked about that as much. Um, what is that? What is that when you do that to your copy? You're selling. What are you selling at that point? You're not selling the product. What are you selling into? Well, you're selling the end benefit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're 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 selling instead of selling, you know, a beautiful garden, you're selling how envious the neighbors will be of how nice your house looks with this beautiful all these beautiful flowers around it. Mm -hmm. right. Um what is that thing about how Someone once said, "We don't sell quarter inch. Uh, we don't sell quarter inch drill bits. We sell quarter inch holes." Right. Um, and you know, the head of Revlon saying, "We don't just sell. We don't just sell water that smells good. We sell hope." Hope, oh, right? You know, those are very important realizations, and that's what makes for you know the most powerful copy. Right. And that's where it comes back to being so important to interview these people that, you know, who represent them or who deal with them 
trying to figure out what those things are. Yeah. Um, so you've got, you know, what pisses them off, you know, chiropractors are pissed off by different things than, than doctors, right? Mm-hmm. Chiropractors generally, I think, don't deal as much with insurance. Maybe they're not that pissed off with the government as doctors are. Chiropractors sort of have a bad reputation. They're probably a little bit pissed off about that, that they're not taken seriously enough. Um, they're, um, you know, people go to them and they don't kind of, they, they think all it takes is one time and they don't come back. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, I didn't get better. And they're like, well, yeah, you didn't come back. Like you were mm-hmm. supposed, I told you, you have to come back, you know, four times for it to take. Mm-hmm. And so that's probably very frustrating to them. That's a little different than doctors, right? Mm-hmm. Doctors are maybe frustrated because people don't take the pills they're supposed to take or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and the government pushes them around and HMOs push them around and they're overworked and, you know, underpaid. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to know, you want to know that, like, who's their enemy? Who, who do they, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is, I, I feel like a really good an analogy would be for, I mean, for the guys in the audience and even girls can relate, you know, if there was some girl that you really wanted to date and marry, you knew that you really didn't have a lot of chances, right? You had to get it right the first time. You would do as much background research as you could. You'd talk to her friends, right? You'd, you'd hang out. We'll go see where she goes to try and see what she <laughs> likes about these places, right? You'd really try to build your wealth of knowledge about her interests, her desires, her wants, her fears, all those sorts of things. So when you do happen chance bump into her at the movie theater or something, you can start a conversation that's going to in- interest her, right? You can invite her out, not to some sham of a place that she has no interest in, but somewhere that she would really be like, right. Like a meaningful interaction. Right. You know, right. and some like let's... Yeah, taking that even mm-hmm. taking that even further, if you wanted to propose marriage to someone, right. You, you want to know enough about them to know why it is they want to get married. Right. Right. If you want to convince them, if you have to convince them, um, you know, you don't want it to be like, oh, well, you know, we'll we'll have a house and we'll fill it with a million children if they don't want to have a million children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you don't mm-hmm. want to give them a picture of living in a nice suburb and living a nice, quiet life when they want to live in the city and have a nice, quiet, you know, and have a noisy life in a penthouse and fun and excitement. Right. Total disconnect. It'd be a total yeah, disconnect. Yeah. Why would they not want to get married, right? What are their objections? You know, maybe they'll feel a little impinge on their freedom or they won't be able to travel and do the things they want to do. So you're going to have to overcome that and say, no, we'll travel together. And when we have kids, our kids will travel with us. We'll all travel together. We'll have a great time. It'll be even better. Right, right, right. So, I mean, this sounds like it's, I mean, obviously it sounds like you need to really, people might be, uh, inclined to skip over some of the research part to really dig deep, but it sounds like that's where all the gems are. That is there is there a diminishing ROI to, on research? I hate to call it research, though. Research sounds <laughs> so boring and scientific, and you know, like pouring over you know obtuse journals and and <laughs> you know searching online for it just sounds so boring. You know, you're really it's just getting to know your market. It's just getting out there and talking to them and, 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 and relating to them and finding out what makes them tick. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's like CSI it's, you know, except with, you know, living people, you know, you're, you want to, you want to dissect your market. You want to see what's really going on with it. What's all these clues, you know, you want to get beneath the surface Mm -hmm. and, and and know what really makes them tick. You know and that's oh. that's fun and exciting and you know and interesting. Well, it sounds like it because right off the bat, I, you know, there's a lot of people that are struggling and like, how do I get more sales or how do I grow my company? But I mean, it's funny because like you're saying, it's not research; it's just getting out and know your market. It's it's just such a fundamental thing. Like, go out and mingle and talk to people and be out there and through this interaction, because I think there's a a, a common. I think there's a common trend for entrepreneurs to like to be like mad scientists cackling and scheming in their offices, right? About mm-hmm. how great this thing's going to be. But there's not as much of an emphasis and time and energy spent on going to where the people are and talking to them about it, right? Yeah. And I, so it's for you, like I said, it's not research. It's really just getting out there. It's honestly, that's something any business owner should already be doing. 
on a regular basis because needs, wants, desires change, the market changes, new products come out, um, policies changes, politics change. So, you know, if you just go out, you do your research now and three years later, you haven't talked to anybody, you're not out there and engaged in, and doing any of this kind of CSI detective work, you really could be, your business could be about to go off a cliff and you'd have no idea about it. I mean, it's like what happened to mm -hmm. newspapers. They, they were completely detached from what people wanted, what their market wanted. And they were in the game of selling wads of advertising, right? Like wrapped up in news stories. And they, they totally missed the boat on what people wanted and what people were saying. And only the few that I think really got to know the end user and why they were going to blogs and why they were going online and was able to pivot and keep up with that. All the other ones just disappeared. You know, they got comfortable and they weren't talking yeah. to their customers. You know, I think as big a danger as going off a cliff is just that that divergence that starts to happen after a while. Like a lot of entrepreneurs who are successful, right? They start a business and they hit it with something, right? That mm -hmm. was exactly right. Like, yeah, the market loved this, you know, this thing your friend did for, um, uh, um, you know, people that want to study martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. they, it was a great product. He, he knew how to market it. And, you know, he was successful. But at a certain point, unless you keep at knowing your market, you and the market start to diverge maybe 1% a day or whatever, right? Mm. So they're a little bit over here. Now they're a little bit over here. Now they're sick of hearing about, you know, how to, the, the cool move that's going to kill people in 10 seconds or whatever, mm. or, or how it's going to increase their con Like it's a little bit, eh, it's not quite so. There's other places. Now his competition, right? Is, is has the same message, mm -hmm. but maybe he's not paying attention. So the market diverges 1%, 1%, 1%. And you don't even notice it because it's only like 1% a day or 1% a month or mm -hmm. whatever it is, 1% a week. Mm -hmm. But at the end of, you know, 52 weeks or at the end of 100 weeks, they're like 100% diverged. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the same as going off a cliff, but you don't notice it as much. Right. It's just all of a sudden what you're doing isn't working anymore and you don't know why. Right. It's like the death of a thousand cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. One cut won't do it. Ten cuts won't do it. But a hundred cuts, suddenly all of a sudden you're bleeding. So yeah. what do you see as the future trends of copywriting? Where is this going? Where do you think it'll be in five years, ten years? What do we need to be aware about now talking about seeing into the future? Well, I think... You know, in a lot of ways, it'll be the same. You know, it's it's about getting the most powerful message to the right people, whatever the means of doing that are. You know, that, that hasn't changed that much from, you know, direct mail and even before direct mail. It hasn't changed that much from some guy, you know, setting up shop in ancient Rome and, you know, advertising on stone tablets or whatever. It's 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 how do you reach the people that you need to reach, whether you reach them by direct mail or on the Internet? What's the most compelling message, you know, that will get them to take the action that you want them to take? And, yeah, technology is now available that makes a lot of things easier and retargeting them and following up with email and delivering things on the Web, you know, makes it different. But I think that those are all just kind of technical things, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The the core the core is still the same and powerful copy. You know, you had asked earlier about, you know, about how powerful a weapon copy is, you know, and it, it it's true. It's so underestimated by most businesses how much better their business could do with better copy. And, you know, I always feel a little bit like, you know, I'm kind of hardly the most objective person to say that since that's what I do for a living. But, you know, it it, it really is true that um, that's how you connect with your customers, for goodness sakes. That's how you that's how you connect with prospects. That's how you convince people to buy from you. And why would you not want to have the most powerful copy that you could have? to do that, the most powerful words, the most powerful ideas, you know, why would you, why would you leave that to, you know, some, you know, junior person that you hired out of college and, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell them to read a few books on copywriting and write copy. 
Right. Well, I, and even the process that you go through, I mean, everything we've talked about here, we, the process you go through is so powerful in terms of really understanding your customer, like saying where the market's at. So even if you're not a copywriter, like as a business owner, you, you almost need to understand, like, you know, David, you are biased, but at the same time, it's understandable because business owners, like I, what you're saying is understandable because the business owner, even if they don't write the copy themselves, they really need to understand their market. You can't just show mm -hmm. up. Most people, they love baking. And so they open up a bakery, but they have no idea who they're going to bake for. And that's something that if you had to write something, some sort of copy to you, that, those are the questions you'd have to ask. Well, who, who are we writing this for? Right. What are they, why do yeah. they want your baked goods? What kind of baked goods are you making? All of a sudden you're getting all these details, the specific, the specifics, and the specificity is what's going to help sell in terms of who you're going to serve, what you're going to serve them, how it's going to be served to them. And a lot of owners don't necessarily think that. A lot of business owners go into something because they have a natural passion for the thing. And then they just love it. And they know why they love it. And they go around looking for them. But they may not be in a forest of people like them. They might be you know, a small group in a larger community. And now they've got to go out and figure out, well, how do I meet these people? Where, where, right? where are these people? And, and, and you can't one person can't accurately predict the needs and wants and desires of a hundred thousand people. We think we can, but we can't, right? There's just too, it's too much of a jungle out there. So mm -hmm. I agree with you a hundred percent on all that. I think that's extremely powerful. I think it's extremely powerful. And again, if anyone listening to this in your business, even if you're not going to write the copy yourself, I think that that's why you say it's powerful to work with copywriters and have that copy centric focus. Cause you're never going to lose sight of the customer. You're going to never going to lose sight of where they're at where they're going, what they want, their needs, their desires, um, if your business has a copy-centric fo focus. So it's no surprise that companies that have that are able to scale to 100 million plus in sales um, because they know what people want versus just hoping that your thing is going to be some big smash hit. Like you're, you're going to be the contestant that goes on America's, uh, what is that, America's Got Talent, and the people just love you. Right. Like that's what most people think. They think they've been training in this thing in, in silence and behind closed doors. They're going to get on stage and the people are just going to love them overnight. But that's just that's the exception. That's not the rule. Yeah. You know, I think it's important that the you kind of touched on this, the person running the company, even if they're not writing the copy, they can make their copy twice as good by helping the copywriter know what that copy should say and what 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 needs to go into the copy. So if they know what the fears are, if they know what the hopes and dreams are, if they know, you know, what the beliefs are of their market, if they know what their market is really looking for, if they know the top 10 benefits of the product, you know, and exactly how to phrase those benefits in a way that the that the customers most respond to because they talk to customers every day. So they know the customer responds to this and not that, you know, if they can give that to the copywriter, then, you know, even a less than a list copywriter is going to be able to write really good copy. Mm, mm, mm. So, so awesome. I think, yeah, I think that's something that, a, that an owner can, can really do to help their business. And David, so if anyone out there has really been resonating this, they're curious, they want to find out some more information, what, how do they get in touch with you? What do you, like, what do you recommend? Do you want them to go to their website? Do they reach out to you on social media? What are some of the next steps that people can follow? Yeah, you can certainly find me on, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn, um, or you could just go to my website. There's a, you know, contact form there and there's some free stuff there. Um, and that's, uh, that site is www.davidldeutsch.com. Perfect. So that's, Oh, go ahead. Better, better spell that one. Um, so David and then L as in Lee and then D E U T S C H. Perfect. So you can go to go davidldeutsch.com or you can look them up on social media. And of course, you've got uh, what is it that people can sign up with on your site? You've got a course, right? On copywriting. If, if someone's never done this there's, or if, you know, there's a course that'll be coming out okay. in a month or so. Um, so right now, if they, you know, sign up for the free stuff that's on the site, that'll get them on the list and get them notified when it does come out. Perfect. 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 And then there's also a free report on copywriting from A to Z. So if anyone's sitting there and they're trying to figure out more, some of these questions to ask or how to approach copywriting, anything like that, go to David L. Deutsch, D-E-U-T-S-C-H.com. 
go ahead and sign up. Dave is a great guy. I've been doing this forever. Um, he's definitely well respected by all the who's who, and you would do yourself and your business a massive favor by starting to understand some of the stuff he's learned through his, ma- his years and involvement with some of these massive, massive promotions. So, David, before I let you go, is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? No, I think as Jim Rutt said, I've already said more than I know. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that you asked me a question a while back about um, about uh, habits or, you know, stuff that makes me, makes other people successful. And I think one of the biggest things, and maybe this is why it's so hard for entrepreneurs to write copy sometimes, is the one of the biggest things is just kind of persistence and obsessiveness. You know, it takes a lot of persistence and a lot of obsessiveness to write great copy. Mm. Um, and, you know, entrepreneurs are often busy running a business, right? They don't have that focus, that attention always mm-hmm. to put into writing the copy unless they really just sort of set aside, you know, a day or two to do it. Um, But sometimes I think the only difference between really the best copywriters are just, you know, we're more willing to put in the work that it takes to make the copy, you know, be great. Right. Because it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to get it. Yep. And focus and attention. Focus, attention, digging, thinking trying to find the exact right word, the exact right way to position something, you know, the exact right angle to show something so it glitters in the best light, Mm -hmm. trying different things, being willing to throw out, you know, first draft, second draft, third draft. But if you're willing to do that, or if you're willing to hire someone who's willing to do that, that's such a tremendous competitive advantage because most people aren't willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And that'll help you really get to know your market and then be able to communicate with them. Cause again, it's like with a group of teenagers, right? If you're trying, if you feel disconnected from your teenager, you couldn't come in and talk to your teenager as an adult. You're going to be seen as an outsider. You really have to take the time to get to know your teenager, what they're into, what their interests are, what, right. What their motivations are and how they talk and be able to now, speak to them how they would speak in a way that's meaningful and impactful for them. And it's tough to do that. If you're, if you're spinning seven plates at the same time, managing juggling payroll, making sure things are you know being taken care of. And I think there's no point in time when that's not a priority. Cause like you said, one, a thousand cuts, right? One, 1% per day, per week, per month, slowly by slowly, if no one else is doing it, mm-hmm. you're just getting, you're getting, you're, you're falling at a sink with your market. And yeah, uh, someone's, someone's got to be paying attention to that. Yeah. Right. On your st- you or whoever, someone on your staff, you know, is kind of like the the go between. Yep. 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 So once again, check out David L. dot com. You can connect with him on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram or shoot him an email. It's all linked to from his site. You can sign up and get free access to his copywriting from A to Z uh, report. And then, of course, he has a course coming out later. Highly recommend it. Uh, it's one of the most powerful skills as spoken or as proven based on the results of campaigns. And that's, that's how you get the campaign. You know, it, if you do it right, when the numbers are small, that's how you scale, right? You can't speak to people one to a hundred. You really have to master speaking to them one to one and getting inside mm-hmm. their heads. And so um, again, thank you so much, David, for joining us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure um, just to share some mind space with you. And I know you have your own following. So I appreciate you coming and helping share with my audience. And uh, hopefully we'll do another follow-up soon. Yeah, I hope so. It's been a pleasure. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. 
It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.